Thank you. First, I want to say thank you to the organizers. Thanks for having me for this presentation. Um, and also thank you to Sages. So we're going to be talking about the Aspire Sys device and aspiration therapy. These are my disclosures. I have a lot of uh, industry-sponsored contacted research, but then I also do some consulting for um, a number of companies. Most of that consulting is surrounded uh, around designing lifestyle therapy programs for uh, multi-center trials. So the concept of aspiration therapy really comes from percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tubes, which we've all used for years, um, for feeding patients who are unable to eat, but also for removing gastric fluid in patients with intest chronic and, uh, intestinal obstruction. Aspiration therapy, or the Aspire Assist system, just takes that one step further and removes a portion of gastric contents after a meal for weight loss. Let me go back. There we go. So the Aspire Assist system, which is uh, produced by Aspire Bariatrics, is uh, composed of components that are implanted. What you can see is in panel A, there's the A tube and skin port. Those stay implanted just like a, a peg tube would. Um, and then there are the external components that are only placed during aspiration itself, and that's in order to open up the skin port with the connector. There's the patient line goes to the companion, which just acts as a one-way valve so that you can either uh, flush water into the system and then also allow contents to drain out um, through the drain tube. It's placed with a standard pull technique using standard, um, uh, standard uh, components for the pull technique. Um, it aspirates, uh, patients aspirate at 20 minutes after a meal. Um, they, most patients do it two to three times a day. Um, I will say that most patients probably end up doing it closer to twice a day rather than three times a day. It removes about 25 to 30 percent of calories from that meal if it's done at 20 minutes. And it accounts for about 50 to 80 percent of weight loss. What that means really is that lifestyle therapy and mealtime behaviors reduce overall food intake. So patients do actually eat less with this therapy, and, and then in addition to that, they're removing a portion of their calories um, to get significant weight loss. So in terms of how we figure that out, we, we actually, uh, during the pilot trial, decided to try to figure out how much uh, is actually aspirated when a patient aspirates after a meal. So we had our metabolic kitchen produce meals um, that were identical, and a patient would eat a meal aspirated either 20 minutes or 60 minutes, um, aspirate that meal, we would collect the aspirate, blend it up, and send it off for bomb calorimetry, and then the identical meal was also um, sent for bomb calorimetry. And from that, we were able to determine the percentage of calories that were aspirated during the meal. What we found was that for a 450-calorie meal that was aspirated at 20 minutes, about 30% of the calories were aspirated. But if patients waited for 60 minutes uh, before aspiration, we only aspirated about half of that out, about 17% of the calories. For a larger meal, it didn't really matter if it was at 20 minutes or at 60 minutes. We were still only able to aspirate about 30% uh, of the calories out. So I'm going to give you some um, data from a couple of trials. Um, there is a, an initial Mexico trial, the U.S. Uh, pilot uh, trial, which was uh, published in Gastroenterology in 2013, and then a European trial, the first six months of which uh, was published in Endoscopy. The Mexico data has not been published yet, but that is in, uh, that is in progress. The two things to note are, that, or the one thing to note is that in the Mexico trial, there was a uh, old, um, or the previous version of the device, which instead did not use a full silicone tube. Part of that tube was made of a different material that actually became um, hard over time and also had a ridge around it. The original skin port was twisted on instead of being held in place um, under pressure. Um, that created um, additional pain for patients, which is why the change was made to a full silicone tube. During the U.S. trial, um, we started out with the old tube and then um, progressed to the new tube. So the initial part of the trial was, was with the old tube. Uh, the European trial was all with the, the new design of the full silicone tube. The baseline characteristics are very similar between all of the groups. The U.S. trial also was a randomized control trial, so we do have a control group that was included in this. The, both the Mexico and the um, European trial were just single-arm trials. Uh, the age was very similar between the groups. Uh, weight was also similar. Uh, 
BMI, BMI was similar. The thing that was different, though, is that more diabetic patients were included in the European trial. Um, in fact, seven subjects in the European trial had diabetes. Five of them were on medications. So when we put all of these uh, studies together um, and we look at both the people who um, completed and didn't complete, the entire uh, study period, we see that in the blue line we have our control subjects. In the, um, the other lines we have the Mexico, the European, and I'm sorry, the Mexico line is the orange line, which um, looks like it got cut off of my, um, uh, of the slide, but Mexico is the orange line, the red line was the aspiration therapy group, the U.S. group that went out to 52 uh, weeks. The green line is the U.S. patients that completed a full um, two years of therapy. Um, the black line and the light blue line are the European um, uh, completers and non-completers. And what you can see is, at least out to six months, there's very similar weight loss between the groups. Um, and in the U.S. trial, that weight loss was maintained out to two years. In terms of behavioral outcomes, because one of the comments we always get is, you know, don't patients eat a lot more after having this therapy because they can aspirate whatever they want? And that's not really the case. So patients actually tell us that, they, um, that they're eating less. They have to chew their food into a mush in their mouth until it essentially disintegrates in order for it to aspirate effectively. So what that really does is it forces somebody to take a long time to eat, a lot of time chewing, and they just get sick of eating. Um, they also have to drink a lot of water with meals, which again is something that we encourage patients to do, but these patients really have to do that in order to get aspiration. They describe that they have decreased anxiety with eating meals out, again, because they know that they can control what they're eating. And they make healthier food choices. So you can see what comes out of the tube. Um, healthy foods, um, fruits, vegetables, lean meats, they really look fine coming out. Things like fried foods, uh, hamburgers, french fries, they don't look very good coming out. So that really is a uh, negative reinforcer for eating those foods. Patients really don't, um, uh, don't eat them as much as, as a result of that. We did very careful assessments of, of eating behaviors as well with the eating disorder examination, which is a structured psychological assessment. It's an interview, so it's not just a, it's not just a questionnaire that really digs deep into eating body shape um, and weight and the attitudes and behaviors related to those. So we saw no evidence of binging or excessive eating in the aspiration therapy group. There were no adverse effects on dietary restraint, body image, desired weight, or shape. There was actually an improvement in both discomfort seeing one's own body and exposing body shape to others. So people actually felt better about their bodies despite the fact that they had um, the device implanted and quality of life improved. In terms of adverse events, most of the adverse events are related to uh, pain around the time of placement. There is also um, some uh, a peristomal irritation that can, that can occur. In, in the Mexico, Mexico trial, there was one uh, G-shunt bumper that did uh, migrate. Um, that was uh, occurred in one patient who was uh, very non-compliant. Um, there was also uh, two patients that had continued um, leakage after the G-shunt was removal. The, the old device was called the G-shunt. The new device, um, uh, the silicone, is called the A-tube. The one thing to remember that there were two patients that required um, surgery in order to, um, to close the fistula, but uh, endoscopic attempt at closure of the fistula was, was not performed. They didn't actually have the um, personnel or the equipment in order to do that. In the U.S. trial, again, we had pain after placement and some irritation um, uh, around the tube that's really treated mostly with just, just things, that, uh, very uh, minimal things, topical. Um, we also had one patient that had a, per a persistent fistula after tube removal, but we were able to adequately uh, manage that endoscopically. There was only one evi uh, episode of hypokalemia in our trial um, in one non-compliant subject, but otherwise the average potassium was uh, 4.2 when you're removing gastric acid. That's one thing to think about. In the European trial, very few adverse events um, related to pain. Um, most patients, again, report pain with uh, placement, which then uh, resolves. I'm also going to give you just a little bit of data from the European super obese trial. The, uh, let's go back, there we go. Um, this data was already presented um, at uh, ITSO. There's a, 
11 patients that were enrolled. The data that I have is completers who went out to six months and um, eight patients who completed 12 months. All of these patients got 10 lifestyle therapy sessions in the first 12 months. Um, their weight is quite high and their BMI is also quite high. But when you compare uh, the European weight loss data with the, um, the completer data for the, America, for the US trial and the, um, the Mexico trial and the um, European trial with the patients who had a BMI of 35 to 55, it's very similar. So this graph is actually total body weight, not excess weight loss. And what you can see is that total body weight loss, really regardless of, what, of weight, um, a certain weight or BMI, um, is about 15 to, to 21% even in the patients who have uh, the uh, BMI above 55. There were no serious adverse events. The procedure was 100% uh, successful in, in all of the patients it was attempted. There were three wound infections, but those were treated conservatively with oral antibiotics. The US multi-center trial um, was a year-long trial and uh, that where aspiration therapy group um, could continue out for an additional four years. The randomized part of that trial is completed. The primary and secondary endpoints were met. Uh, the PMA has been submitted to the FDA, and that data will be presented at Digestive Disease Week. So in conclusion, aspiration therapy produces long-term successful weight loss in small trials in Mexico, the United States, and Europe, both in patients with a BMI of 35 to 55 and of 55 and greater. There were no evidence of abnormal eating behaviors that were induced by aspiration therapy, and if anything, eating behaviors improved, and uh, food choices also improved. There was a good safety profile in all of the patients, and further studies are ongoing. And I, of course, I'd like to acknowledge all the investigators and subjects and all of the centers that were involved in these trials. Thank you.